Welcome to UK Business Show, UK's premier business show where we feature business thought leaders, high achievers, and industry experts. Today's episode is brought to you by World Outsourcing Solutions Limited, a company that specializes in helping executive business owners with virtual assistant services and business growth systems. Here's your host, UK Kachidori. Hi guys, welcome back. Now I have a question for you. Are you worried about your financial results that you're getting during this special time? Or are you pulling your hair out over the inconsistency of income or sales in your business? Maybe you're one of those people who is ready to end this whole worrying business of what you're going to be doing when it comes to your next payroll. Well, if you're one of those people, you're in the right place because today on the show, I have a gentleman who is actively helping people with these same questions. We're going to be talking about the financial education, how you can succeed today, given all that is happening into the world today, how can you carve your way in today's market? So once again, thank you for joining us. Thank you, uh, Rekam, for being on the show here today. Thank you for having me. Incredible. Now, I understand you guys are uh, uh, having a great time over there in the U.S. Uh, where are you based exactly? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in the New England area of the United States. Uh, I'm in the Connecticut state. Yes. And yeah, we're having a blast. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Now, uh, I understand you're one of the emerging leader in the financial education and empowerment. And you've done a bit of uh, TED speaking. You've wrote uh, two books uh, at the moment, which are doing very well. And uh, you're a co-founder of a non-profit and extended hand. Uh, we want to talk about that non-profit extended hand project you have later on. But for those who haven't come across your work, very briefly, tell us your background, uh, how you go to where you are, and specifically, into a position of trying to help other people in the area of finance. Sure. So um, I'm a millennial, and um, I grew up to two very young parents. Uh, my parents were 17, 18 years old when I was born, and so definitely heavily relied on um, extended family to really um, take care of me and my siblings. Uh, at different points in my growing up, we have experienced financial hardship. And I think a lot of that is attributed to a lack of financial education and, and experience, right, for um, these young parents. So there's a period of time in my life where um, my parents did separate. And in that, I became um, very much more aware of what the finances in the household looked like. Um, we had leveraged government assistance. Um, there are different stories that I tell about um, seeing eviction notices or other ways that we have had to kind of manage what our um, what our financial circumstances were. And so that really inspired me uh, once I got into um, a newer environment. So I left the, um, the environment that I grew up in, New York, and um, started becoming exposed to concepts, products, terms, um, people would influence what my uh, spectrum of knowledge looked like as it related to personal finance and then inspire me to go on and continue that education so that I can then go back and share what I've learned with other people. Indeed. Uh, one of the things in your story there was uh, during the, what some would say difficult time, you know, uh, you figure out a way of thinking differently about money that you change your belief system. Can you share a bit about that? Yeah, so, um, and it's funny because my parents and I frequently talk about this um, in hindsight, now that I spend so much time talking about my experience. Uh, but my parents never taught me um, to look at money from a poverty perspective. And I, that's what I, um, that's how I refer to it, with a poverty mindset. But it was in observing behaviors that I learned to aspire for what it is that I knew. And so, you know, like I mentioned, we took advantage of government assistance um, because we, we didn't have a choice. But I figured at that time in my life, when I got to an age where I was supporting myself financially, that I would take advantage of government assistance as well. 
and it didn't occur to me that it was uh, possible or likely that I, at a young age, would be able to um, exist, really, and, and maintain my own financial spaces without leveraging government assistance. And so, um, you know, to your point, in changing the mindset, first understanding what is possible was important. Um, understanding how to position yourself to accomplish those things was important. And then setting the goals and executing on them uh, was important for me as well. And a lot of that education uh, kind of happened by osmosis. So I worked in banking for a number of years. Uh, I got to see the spectrum of interactions from um, people who were very wealthy and people who were not. Uh, but there was also education, you know, that I took initiative to learn, right? Books, podcasts, seminars, workshops. I mean, you name it, I've done it. And in those environments, I was kind of able to expand my perspective on what finance could look like for me and then create goals that I was able to take action on. Indeed, indeed. So would you say there was something driving you to this path? If you would, what would that be? <laughs> uh, I would say an oversimplified answer to that question would be that I just simply didn't, not, didn't want to be poor. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to continue to live in that frame of existence. Um, but to expound on that a little bit more, I think once I realized that I was making changes successfully for myself, I became very excited about sharing that information with other people. Yes. And so, um, in being able to share the change in perspective, the change in behavior, the change in results with other individuals and see, you know, their amazement, their curiosity, they're taking the initiative to do some of the same things that really inspired me to continue doing that. And, um, and that's how I kind of landed where I am today. Um, you know, I, I, when I share my story, whether it be, um, through, you know, forms like this or my book or anything else. And I, even one person reacts to that and says, wow, like I didn't think about that that way. You've changed the way that I've thought about money. I want to do this. I'm inspired to do that. Like that makes all the difference for me. And that just gives me more and more fuel to keep going, to reach more and more people, to inspire more and more people, to continue to learn so that I can provide valid content um, so that, um, you know, the content doesn't become just basic or stale, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. It's fascinating, you know, before you start helping people, you just don't know the joy that comes out of it. You just hear other people say, oh, yeah, go out and help people. You feel good and you will get more out of it as much as the people you are helping. It's, it's a foreign concept. But once you start helping others, you get this energy to keep on going. And truly, if you are a business owner and you want to get love back, go help somebody somebody who might need what you know. And it's amazing uh, that the more you teach others or you show others uh, what you know, the more you get to know yourself and the more you recall what you are trying to teach. Just like they say, you know, the teacher recalls a lot more than perhaps a student because they are teaching it and they're engaging all their faculties. Well, coming back to you, let's jump straight uh, into uh, helping somebody who maybe is having a difficult financial situation right now. If you were to sit down with them, what would you advise them as the very first step to sort their finances out, be it on a personal level or even in running their organization? Well, I would start with the personal because I think, you know, success financially really starts in your mind. And so I would want to figure out where they are mentally, right? Right. And understanding how they view money, understanding what they're viewing as an issue or a roadblock to their success financially. And then I would also underscore, I think it's so important when we talk about money, that uh, personal finance is personal. And so what success looks like for me might be different than what success looks like for you. And it's going to vary based off of your circumstances, based off of your station in life, based off of, uh, you know, whether you're single or in a relationship or have children, what your education level looks like, what your income looks like, what debt you're 
bring into the equation. So I think it's very important for people to kind of take um, inventory really of where they are and what are all the different variables that exist that impact their financial circumstances and from there create a plan um, that speaks to their unique situation instead of providing this, you know, cookie cutter or, or, or a box approach to managing their finances. Yes. Are there any tools they can use to make sure that they do this very first step? Absolutely. I think, um, first of all, budgeting is so important. And um, budgeting looks different from diff for different people. I've seen complex spreadsheets that allow for you to input different uh, aspects of what your income and expenses look like. Um, and then I've seen some things that are very simplistic. But ultimately, I think, you know, getting it down on paper really kind of is the slap in the face or the reality check, right, for people who are not sure of where their money is going. And if you don't know where your money is going and you don't know how much money is coming in, then, you know, that's a recipe for disaster. So I think the first step is just to, um, and anybody can, you know, type in Google really quickly or whatever um, browser they want to use, um, free budget template. And um, I'm sure millions of them will pop up. But um, even if they don't want to use a template, they just, you know, pull up their statement. I mean, banks provide electronic or paper statements pull up their statement, get a pen and paper, write down, you know, what are you spending money on every month? Um, how much money are you bringing in every month? And so you really get a kind of a baseline understanding of, you know, where the money is going. And then from there, you can create, um, or not create, but you can take steps to really monitor what your expenses look like. Um, I know it's very common here for people to, you know, stop at a Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks on the way to work and grab a cup of coffee or breakfast every single day. And they don't know how, you know, those $5 or $2 or however much it costs adds up. And then they're spending, you know, money for lunch and then money for dinner, constantly eating out. And so you think that those small amounts that they're occurring are small amounts, but over time, those small amounts add up. And, um, you know, you, you look at a week of, of this behavior, that might be, you know, your electricity bill, your cable bill, you know, something else. So um, there's that factor. But I also realize that a lot of people, um, and especially in the United States, live off of their credit or what access to credit that they have available. So now you're living above your means. And so understanding, you know, what is living at your means or below your means versus living above your means and, um, and really abusing credit as an extension of income is a huge mistake that I think a lot of people make um, in their personal life. Indeed. Again, you know, you can translate the same principle in your business. You know, you speak to your bookkeepers and have a look at all the expenses, what is it being bought in the organization and all that is the same concept. The key thing there is to monitor what is coming in and what is going out, and then you can make a decisive uh, action. Suppose uh, somebody is getting stuck with this step. Uh, what is the right mindset, maybe, that you could encourage them with? You know, I would say that most people will get stuck with this step because it's a tedious process. And so, um, you know, it's, it's certainly not fun, but you know that it has to get done because it's kind of like, you know, grand and bear through it. Uh, but my advice for an individual who, you know, constantly getting stuck before completing the process is, you know, do little bits at a time. So you don't have to complete your entire, you know, budget spreadsheet for the month or the year or the quarter at one in one sitting. You might um, spend time doing it for the week. And then, you know, when you get some more time, spend time, you know, expanding that out. I think a lot of times when people get started, they um, they look at the daunting task ahead and they get intimidated by the amount of work that's required instead of taking small steps every day towards reaching their goal. And so I would say be fair to yourself. You know, um, take small steps, take a break, come back to it. Um, as long as you're executing on those disciplines, mm -hmm. like you said, monitoring what's coming in, monitoring what's going out, being, uh, being vigilant about, you know, how you're spending, 
then you're going to see success over time. Absolutely. You know, on a personal note, you know, when I got started, I, like many people, had difficulties in monitoring what was coming in and what was going out. And I had difficulty in bringing myself to look at that until I hired a virtual assistant. So somebody I was paying to look at that. And once every week on a Monday, we'll sit down and she would ask me, uh, what is this? You know, where is this going? It was an accountability session. And I know some people do that with their coaches. But the what worked for me is I had somebody else that I, you know, I was talking to who could help me with that. And again, that could help you as a uh, business owner. Let's jump on to uh, what else can they do? Say they've got this aspect figured out. What can they do next? Um, so a really important principle that I spend time talking or talking about rather is this concept of paying yourself first. Right. As a as an individual, right? As you know, from a personal perspective, but also as a business owner. Um, and so when you start with budgeting and you take note of what is coming in and what's going out, before you get to a point where you're spending you want to make sure that you're taking a portion of whatever your income is and you're putting it away for you um, and whatever your long-term goals are as it relates to saving, as it relates to um, growing your business. I think, you know, when, when people do that and they incorporate this practice, first of all, it forces you to live beneath your means because you're taking a portion of your income and you're putting it away. But second of all, um, because it's happening first, you're not having to play catch up after the fact. So, so many people, when it comes to you know their money, they look to save what's left over after they've spent everything, or after that you know they've purchased what it is that they feel like they need. And um, just that small shift of paying yourself first. So as soon as you get income, you put money towards you know money away towards you know saving for the long term. You will um, eventually over time that money is going to grow. And um, the hope is that you, you can use that money for um, you know, whatever your plans are, retirement, emergency, um, just to have as a cushion for, you know, whatever, passing it on to future generations. And um, so I think from, from, from the perspective of budgeting, understanding what's coming in and what's going out, you then know how are, are you spending frivolously and what those um, frivolous spending you can eliminate that by taking a portion of whatever it is that you have putting it away. Indeed. Um, and then the second part to that statement was uh, just escaped me. Can you ask the question again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's fine. You know, I, I like the point that you said, uh, pay yourself first. It's just a change in a mindset. You know, but the results from putting that uh, practice into place are enormous because it gives you peace of mind that you have something set aside. If an emergence comes, you just know that there is something on there. And I cannot tell you what it does, uh, but for me, it brings that confidence. I can go and attack a new project rather than worrying what could happen. Because if I'm worrying of what could happen, I'm not going to uh, try it because I think I would lose money. But if I know that I've got a cushion, <laughs> uh, I can go and try something out, knowing that if it doesn't work out, I am covered. Uh, all my expenses and all that is, is, is covered. So love that concept. I first uh, learned about it from T. Half Eka, you know, the Millionaire Mind Intensive. Uh, and mm -hmm. truly, truly helped me. Uh, in how we do it. Suppose somebody has got that dialed in, you know, they've got their budget, they're paying themselves first. What's next? Well, then you start focusing on developing multiple streams of income. And I know that um, this concept is a little bit more difficult than the previous two, um, especially if you're a specialist in a particular line of business. Um, but I think with the pandemic that we're experiencing, it's forced a lot of business owners um, to look at ways to leverage their skill set 
or expertise um, in a non-traditional sense. I think the best example of that is education, right? You have um, formally uh, institutions where you are physically sitting in a classroom, right? You're learning from an individual sitting in front of you. And then all of a sudden you have to pivot into online learning. And so now people are forced to perform, you know, 100% online. And this is, you know, this is difficult. I think this is a difficult change. Um, but it's a testament to, I think, um, what that pivot looks like. Uh, and so I, I don't want to pick a specific type of business industry, but I'm just kind of thinking, you know, maybe somebody who is a baker, right? They sell, they, they, they bake and, you know, they can't bake or you know, open up their shop. Maybe they can teach lessons online on how to bake bread or how to bake whatever it is. And so now you're, you're, you're monetizing your experience in a different way than what is considered traditional. Um, maybe you are writing a blog and you're getting traffic and, you know, monetizing that way. Maybe you are doing virtual cooking lessons. And so I think just being open to um, pivoting what is, what is your skill set and generating additional income stream. And of course, in, in this environment, it's a necessity. But, you know, when we think about going into a sense of normalcy, right, where you get to perform in your business in the way that you prefer to, thinking about other ways to leverage that skill set so that you can generate income in different ways. Um, I've had some relative success during the pandemic and pivoting to um, writing for publications that pay and sharing my experience. So it's not a um, it's not a one-on-one -on -one coaching or a group coaching experience. I'm not standing up and speaking in front of people, but I'm sharing my thoughts and strategies in, um, in writing. And, you know, people are subscribing to that. They're enjoying the content. And then they may come find me. And then there's a layer of income that's happening, right? So the publication is paying me for the contribution, but then the individual might want to purchase my book. And so that's additional income coming in that way. Or well, the person might want to um, transition into one-on-one -on -one coaching with me. And that's another stream of income. And so I think, you know, not discounting the smaller stream as being irrelevant is important too. Because if you have, you know, two or three or four or five different streams of income, well, all that money adds up. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, recently, I was talking to uh, one of my consulting companies uh, and they were asking the same question, how can we uh, diversify? How can we create additional uh, income streams? So I said, talk to your customers, you know, they will tell you what else they need. And then you can add that one on what you already do because they will tell you what it is that they need. So if you're a business owner, you might want to be doing that as well. Look at what you currently do. What do your competition do on to add value to their project or to their product or services? And you'll be able to do that and you can track the success of those. If it is uh, something that is sustainable and that doesn't take you from your existing project, you can incorporate that like consulting as we are talking about here. So it's an exciting time. And again, you never know uh, these little multiple streams of income might end up becoming your major income stream, yeah, you know, because uh, life has a tendency of throwing up a surprise. Uh, as we're coming toward the end of our conversation, Rakim, here, uh, what is the best mindset for business owner to have when it comes to their financial freedom? Best mindset, I think, is a um, continuous education or continuous improvement mindset. Um, you know, we tend to get stuck in our own ways, right? We tend to find something that works and then we don't want to try anything else. And when it comes to finance, especially in the world today, there's so many moving parts and, and things that are happening and changing, right? Um, and so I think it's important to, you know, there was a period of time where credit didn't exist. And so people were like, you know, cash is king. I'm going to pay everything in cash. And then credit becomes a dominant system in the United States. You can't do anything without credit. You can't, you know, buy a car, buy a house, get an apartment, get, get insurance. You know, you need credit for everything, even, even some jobs. And so there's a whole generation of people who have to now relearn, reset 
their mindset as it relates to building credit. Um, and now we see in the world of finance that there's a rise in popularity with, with cryptocurrency, right? And um, a lot of people are starting to pivot towards understanding what that looks like. And is, is digital currency going to become the main currency um, as opposed to what we're, you know, what we've known for tradition um, or generations rather? So I think, you know, when it comes to personal finance, it's important to just always be learning. Um, even if you don't execute on what it is that you know, what you learn, just know that it's out there. Know, you know, how to use it. And so that if there is a need for you to pivot, it's not like a culture shock for you. Absolutely. Keep learning. Do whatever it takes for you to keep learning. How do you go about identifying who to learn from? Uh, so that's tough, actually, because there's a lot of misinformation out there. I like that question. Um, for me, it's kind of like trial and error, really. Um, I will hear something that somebody says and that somebody is pretty passionate about. And then I'll just look for other streams that lead to whatever that that topic is. So if we're talking about um, real estate, for instance, somebody might talk about a, a really good real estate investing strategy. And I'm like, oh, you know, real estate's pretty popular with a lot of books on real estate. Let's find out how people are leveraging real estate to build wealth. And then you go down that rabbit hole. Um, there's a ton of information out there as it relates to real estate and how to leverage that for wealth building practice. Um, same thing with cryptocurrency. And that's that's the um that's an area that I'm not very well versed, but it's something that I'm aware of. And so understanding what is cryptocurrency, uh, what are the different types of currency out there, how are people using it, where is it accepted? Um, why is it not regulated? Um, why are people like loving cryptocurrency right now? And so um just kind of really getting the base understanding of how it's used from a factual perspective. Remove the bias, remove the preference, and just understand, you know, what is this concept? Um, and from there, you can kind of form your own opinion. And then if you decide that you want to try it out, then there's that trial and error period. Indeed, absolutely. Well, just to add on that, one of the ways I have come to use of lately is find at least three experts on that particular subject. And you get to find out a common thread in that. And oftentimes that common thread usually is something that is working. They're totally different experts, but on that particular area, because certain things still holds true. And uh, then go ahead and learn from there. Another way that I learn uh, new things is by attending podcasts like this ones, you know, where we bring some amazing, great people who are producing real results in today's market. Uh, hear what they're saying and uh, where are they coming from and follow up on their website. You'll find that uh, they have a particular area they're very good at uh, and you you really get to know what is going on. So, uh, you know, be open-minded. You know, somebody once said, our brain works better when open, just like when the umbrella is open, that's when it does the amazing stuff, not when it's closed. So I want to encourage you as a business owner, you know, uh, be open because you will be amazed at what you can learn uh, as a business owner and encourage your business and those that are relying on you as well. Now, is there anything, Rakim, that I have not asked you but you feel very passionate about when it comes to this area and you'd like our audience to know about? I think that we, we covered the areas that I'm the most passionate about as it relates to concepts and mindset um, with personal finance, but I would just to underscore again that personal finance is personal. Um, and so again, what works for one person doesn't mean that it's going to work for you. Yes. And um, you know, leveraging all the concepts that we talked about today, paying yourself first, um, monitoring the inputs and outputs as it relates to you know your income and your expenses, um, continuing to educate yourself. Like those are going to position anybody from you know any situation or background to be able to make informed decisions about how they move forward. And so I think that's the most important. Indeed. What is the conversation that goes on in your mind when it comes to wealth? Uh, or the one that you have found successful people have about wealth or money or finances in general? Uh, well, for one, that money is a tool. I think a lot of people uh, lose sight of that. There's this desire to acquire money um, for the sake of acquiring it or hoarding it. And 
that there's scarcity, right? There's not enough of it to go around. And that's an illusion. The, you know, there's plenty of money to go around. And, you know, when people start to look at money as a tool that is not necessarily good or evil, um, but something that is um, there to help you position yourself to be your best self, I think that's, um, that's when you realize that, that's actual, actualization of wealth. Um, and this idea of wealth, I think, also starts in the mind. And so a lot of people, they assign a dollar amount to it. And I think that that's important when it comes to goal setting. But um, when it comes to just, you know, what is your purpose? What is your why? What are you doing this for? Um, you're not going to find that validation externally. The more money that you make without really kind of understanding or centering yourself in your why, the more money you're going to want to make. And so it will never be enough. Um, so, th- you know, those are some of the conversations that, I, that I'm that um, i experiencing. When I think about some of the most wealthy people in the world, you think about, um, you know, what is something that they all have in common, right? They're, they're adding value. They're providing uh, substance to other people. Um, I don't think that I'm certainly they're aware of how much money they have, um, but they're also free from the burden of having to worry about the things that we worry about when looking to acquire money. And so they're able to be their best selves. They're able to make, um, you know, these wonderful changes in the way that we just operate as a whole um, across the globe. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. Uh, for those who wants to learn more, I came from you. Where can they find you? So they can go to my website, www.rockkimsabri.com. So it's R A H K I M S A B, like boy, R E E dot com. And um, from my website, I have all of my social media links, uh, my books, ways to contact me. Uh, so that's the best place. Incredible. And talk to us in wrapping up our call of the uh, foundation, nonprofit foundation that you uh, and your colleagues have put together and what amazing work you're doing there. Sure. So uh, we started an organization called An Extended Hand Inc. about two years ago. And the focus of that organization is to end homelessness. So we find that um, ending homelessness is certainly a huge undertaking. And one of the approaches that we are taking towards contributing to the end of homelessness is education, right. um, helping people understand um, financial education, helping people understand how to become employable or how to pursue entrepreneurship. Um, and from there, we feel that people will become empowered and that we can prevent a huge population of people who are at risk of being homeless or currently impacted by homelessness to um to change their circumstances. Wonderful. Well, congratulations on making a difference and literally uh, putting something in motion. Always say uh, 